Starting now. And on the sound on. Have a good old time. Oh, wait, I didn't have to plug in the audio. So, thank you so much for coming to this end of day Saturday. I know, Saturday uh, session on uh, how to speak to gamers. So, uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, braving, uh, uh, braving the, uh, the rain and, uh, and yeah. not getting the bars already in, in here in New Orleans. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. I, I know that uh, this is a brand new topic that um, the, one of the things I realized in the past years, I've been speaking for about six years on education technology and whatnot, and I realized that uh, over the years that I would make references to video games and, and cartoons and whatnot, you know, things that I grew up with. And those jokes just kind of like flew over people's heads. So then I started pulling people, it's like, you know, how many people play video games? And I realized that the vast majority of educators never play video games or are not gamers. And I created this session because, I, because no one's talking about it. No one's talking about how do we reach these kids who are gamers. So, so excuse me. So, thank you so much for coming. I'd like to thank you for coming to this meeting. So, hello everyone. Hello. I'm Nye. Hi, Nye. Hi, Nye. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Nye, and I am a gameaholic. Hello, you've been a gameaholic. Oh, boy, oh, boy. For a very long time, actually. You know, it's all started with, uh, with the Atari 2600 and migrated to uh, Nintendo and uh, Commodore 64. And so I am a game and product. Do I have any other game and products here in this room? Please. Hey, uh, my name is Josh. I'm a game of <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave away all my gaming systems because I dropped college classes, lost jobs. So I uh, try and stay away from that. I started with Commodore 64. We go with Atari, Nintendo, Nintendo 64, Super Nintendo, <laughs> PS1, PS2, PS3, Xbox One. Oh, it's all cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Slash and music. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm primarily a PC game myself. Yeah. So. so, anyone else wants to admit that you're a game of all? No, you don't want to. <laughs> Thank you very much, Josh, for oh, admitting sure. uh, Yes? I kicked my addiction about 15 years ago. 15 years ago. Wow, so you were an early game of Holly. You know, back when you went to some merger. So, wonderful. So, here we are in the session, and we're talking about video games. But the thing is, I like to say that I have been two years sober. Uh, my last game that I played was Diablo 3, because I had to wait so many years for that game to come out, because the last one was Diablo 2, that I had to play it. I had to play it, because that was what I grew up with, playing Diablo 2 to death. That is until October 1st, 2015, when Metal Gear Solid V came out. So that game, I had been waiting for eight freaking years. <laughs> and I fell off the wagon. I had to play because the, the, it's, 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 it's the final of the series and, and, and it just had to happen. I, I, I had to break into it. But then, November 10th, last week, this game came out, Fallout 4, uh, which I waited seven years for to, to come out. Oh gosh, you know, this is not looking good for me. And on Black Friday, I will be going out and picking this game up. I need help, really. I do, I need help. Um, who wants to be my sponsor? Can you pay for me? I want to create a game of all the not profit for you. For purpose. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, you know, we're at the end of the day. I want to make this little session really lively. And we're going to go over a lot of content, but you know, I just want to say that you know, we're going to be talking about something that most people don't talk about. So, we're going to, so let me just give you a quick agenda here. Uh, we're going to go over a little bit about the history of video games. Because like I said, most uh, of the that I talk to and deal with uh, aren't gamers. So I'll just kind of show you like, what kind of came around over the past uh, two decades. Um, I want you to also talk about video game addiction. Which, as you very well know, uh, I'm addicted to, you're addicted, she's addicted, maybe him too. You know. <laughs> uh, 
And really, you know, let's tie it together. You know, how does this affect us as educators? You know, how do we look at this and say, okay, these plays, kids are playing these games. What, what's going to, how is this affecting education? And how is this going to change the landscape over the years? Uh, we're going to talk about the culture of gamers. So there's, a, there's like this entire subculture that if you don't understand them, then you don't know how to reach them. So I'm trying to, I want to try to teach you that. Uh, some educational approaches, we're going to cover that, uh, just so that you could uh, try to apply some of these, uh, not this knowledge, into your classroom. And uh, at the end, I'm going to give you a couple tools that might help. Uh, there's a lot of uh, other tools that, are, uh, tools that are being developed, so I'm going to just kind of profile two of them, and kind of just go over uh, well, the different uh, approaches that they've made. So, I want to talk a little bit about me and the education system. So, First off, I want to say that I was made in Taiwan. <laughs> That's okay, you can laugh. Come on. <laughs> yeah. um, I, was brought, I was brought over here as a tenor age of two, and, uh, and because of that, um, English was my second language. So that led itself to um, have, me, have a lot of problems with uh, reading, uh, I had reading deficiencies. I actually made it through high school without reading a single novel. Not, not because I didn't want to, because I would have to. I would look at a book and I would read it, and I would have to read it like two or three times to even comprehend it. So like that just made it really difficult. So I'm like, screw that, cliff notes. <laughs> but the thing is, like, you know, it made it. Really, I had a really difficult time reading, uh, and and uh, another problem that I had was uh, I had a lot of energy, and and I and I had all ADHD. So. Yeah, do you know any kids right now in class that has ADHD? Raise your hand. <laughs> oh, cool. Then. So some of you don't deal with any kids at all, probably. Well, any kids, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, so, so the thing is, like, you know, back then, ADHD was, was an emerging problem. And, uh, and now it's like, you know, it's everywhere. You know, all the kids are having you know, have attention problems. Um, but for me, um, oops, but for me um, one of the things that I did was uh, I, grew, I grew up in a very poor environment. Like, Parents opened up a Chinese restaurant. Uh, we were uh, uh, free, and reduced lunch, free, free and reduced lunch. So I'm pointing that out because they didn't have enough money to take me to a psychiatrist to put me on medication. So what I had to do, well, they had to deal with it, but I had to learn to take this problem and actually turn it into my greatest asset. In fact, because I was able to um, control or harness the, the multiple passive attention that I have, um, I actually have the ability to uh, absorb and take on more information than any of my te peers at the time. So I would, I would be able to like uh, look at something and actually see and, uh, and comprehend far greater amounts of data than most of my peers. So because of that, I gravitated toward video games. So like, you know, you know uh, when you look at, watch the movie The Matrix and they're doing that, they shoot the bullet, bullet at uh, Andrew Smith and or they do like this, like really slow motion, uh, or Neo, sorry, Neo, they do this slow, slow motion all the time. So like, you know, when I'm playing a video game, like, and some, sometimes like, you know, they're throwing all this data at me, and I, I get into like this zone where things are kind of like slowing down for me, but they're not really slowing down, but I'm able to kind of process that information and actually react to it at like lightning quick speeds because I can, I can absorb it. It's just, uh, it's just phenomenal. So I like to say, like, you know, is this really a problem, or maybe is it a superpower? Is it a superpower that these kids have? Now all we need to do is figure out how to harness that power and turn it into something that is primarily destructive into something that can be made good. So, uh, I, I want to put this on that, you know, even though, uh, because I had this, like, tension problem, I, I failed a math class in high school. Now, you look at me, like, I'm Chinese. How unheard of is that to, for a Chinese person to fail a math class, right? <laughs> so, so, it was, it's, so, you know, it wasn't because I didn't get the math. It was because the teacher was going so slow that I just couldn't um, keep up with it because I just disconnected. I was like, this is going so slow, I'm just going to fall asleep. And I often did, and then would throw a chop at me. Chop, yes, chop. <laughs> um, so, like I said earlier, uh, I love video games. They actually help my attention. They taught me to teach myself programming because I want to make my own games. So I taught myself how to do BASIC and, and then C, uh, Pascal, and all that kind of stuff. So I could like, start making these little mini games to entertain myself. Uh, and then, which actually led me into digital learning, uh, where I actually, my, my goal is to create a learning system that resonated with me because the education system didn't fit me 
uh, didn't have a model for me at the time. But with technology and with all the things that we can do today, you know, we can start building these tools. So I wanted to build a tool that actually helped me selfishly so that it could actually, in fact, help the, uh, the students of today. So that's a little bit nothing. So um, we are living amongst a culture of instant gratification. So actually, I forgot to ask earlier, anybody here attend my sessions before in the past? Cool. Thank you very much for coming back. <laughs> So I'm going to pull up this uh, video here. Uh, oops, the I didn't prepare. Okay, we're going to stick this in here, and then I'm going to pour in the milk. <laughs> I hope this works because I didn't bring a change of pants. <laughs> Look, I googled it. It's a fake kitchen. <laughs> I'm only coming back here because I forgot if I did I hit the record button. Yes, I did. <laughs> one, one year I thought I hit the record button and I did it and I enjoyed it. So, so anyway, um, so anyone love Big Bang Theory? Watch Big Bang Theory here. Yeah, I love that show. You know, just a bunch of uh, of uh, uh, physicists and scientists doing their everyday funny stuff. Uh, and uh, but you know, it, the, the truth of that, you know, that clip was like. You know, these kids are born with their information right there in their pockets, in their hands. Uh, so, gone are the days of, like, if you remember, actually physically relocating yourself to a, another location, such as the library, looking up information in a Dewey Decimal System or a card catalog, and then, you know, even going to, as far as, like, searching, uh, scanning through reams and reams of microfiche and finding that one article to, to get to the information. Information took a lot of work. And now we have it like right in the palm of our hands where we can just say, hey Siri, what is the cloud? <laughs> she says it's beyond my capabilities at the moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Siri. You failed me. <laughs> anyway, um, so you know, so they have this information right there in the hand. So, like, you know, so when we talk about like education, you know, we need to kind of provide that uh, instant gratification uh, for these students because we're actually catering to an accelerated mind. Um, it's not that they're not getting the information; it's coming to them in bits and pieces too slow. So, so what the way I think about it is, and, and gamification is a large part of the process. Is you know, when you play a video game, you don't just do it once; you do it twice, three times, four times, five times. And over the repetitions of what we call remediation, over that, that time, the, the multiple times, it, it sticks in their head. So we, if we expect these kids to sit there and pay attention to what we're saying and get 100% of it, it ain't going to happen. It needs to come through repetition. It needs to do, be done through remediation. And that's the only way to really get these things stuck in their head. It's because they have a mind that's so accelerated that they need information to come from you. But they also want stimulation from somewhere else. They also want uh, to be able to look stuff up. It's like, you know, when I do these sessions, like, actually, you guys are a really great captive audience, uh, but um, a lot of cases, like, people are on their smartphones, looking stuff up, tweeting this, that, I mean, you're at the uh, keynote speaker, and I see, like, half the audience is on their phones doing what not what. You know, it's a great keynote, but, you know, everyone's, you know, distracted, or are they multitasking? So, um, I'll see a uh, show of hands. Who here is a gamer playing arcade games? Raise your hands. Arcade games. So this is like you know, Pac-Man. You know, you know, going to a location yeah, and playing these. Uh, okay, cool. I actually got quite a few video, uh, arcade games here. Huh? Back in the day. Back in the day. Yeah. Back in the day. All right. So console gamers, raise your hand. So Nintendo. Uh, like, okay, cool. Good. Um, portable gamers. So we're talking about the, uh, Nintendo DS, PSP. You know, not not mobile gamers. Uh, actually, I probably should specify. You know, smartphone gamers. So. I should see a lot more hands, you know. Smartphones has made gaming so ubiquitous that, like, it's everywhere, you know. And, uh, and I know a lot of people, you know, a lot of, like, you know, people who would have never played a video game become addicted to these smartphone games. 
All right, so any of you play solitaire? Yes. All right, raise your hands. Any of you play solitaire? Okay, good, not, not so many of you. <laughs> so, you know, so say, you know, gaming and game culture is everywhere. And actually, you know, I think by the nature of the title, I was going to attract more gamers to the session than, than normal. Anyway, so, so I just want to go over a brief history of video games. So first, video games started with this. Atari came out with this little box that kind of moved this dot around, and it bounced back and forth. Yeah. Pong! <laughs> yeah, it was called Pong. But yeah, it's like, so, so the thing is, like, this was pure innovation because now people were able to turn these dials, move this thing up and down, and actually interact with the digital media. And people were enthralled by something as simple as this because it, it allowed the people who were gra gravitated toward uh, games like this because they wanted a medium of expression that was you know, digital, that was, uh, that was temporary, that could be completely repeated over and over again without having to reset a board, for example. And then moving forward to you know, the next generation, we, have, uh, we got Pac-Man, uh, Donkey Kong, Super Mario Brothers. So, so as you can see, over the years, the games got a lot more, a little more sophisticated. You, know, you got RPGs like uh, Zelda, Street Fighter, never made it to the, <laughs> never made it to the, yeah, Sonic, you know, and Sonic, like, you know, you got this uh, hedgehog that's running through this, this level, and they're going like a million miles per hour, and then they're like you know, trying to jump and avoid collect points and avoid these uh, uh, monsters or, or animals uh, to make it to the end. And it's just like so much, uh, so fast, so repetitive, and so uh, engaging uh, that uh, really made it. So, so, so video games, you know, I want to basically bring up a, a, a point with uh, video games and, and how the entertainment that we had as kids has affected us uh, over the years and how it's transforming. So this graphic I have pulled up here on my right, your left, um, you can see that we have iconic cartoon characters. So many of you probably grew up with these characters, like you know, who here loves Mickey Mouse? Raise your hand, Mickey Mouse. All right, we all love Mickey Mouse. You got Disney Channel, it's on all the time, you know, and, and the thing is like, you know, we're, we got Mickey, we got Smurfs, we got SpongeBob, and Felix the Cat. So these are uh, iconic cartoon characters that um, when you were little, your parents would sit you in front of the television and say, sit here and watch this. So you'd be entertained by these characters, you become, you know, you would build an actually kind of like a relationship with them. You, they have stories, you know, you, you love them, you go to Disneyland, you buy the Mickey Mouse ears, you know, so you, see, you form a, a, an attachment to these characters because as a kid, you know, you were being uh, told these uh, wonderful stories and, and, and you love them. So, sitting in front of the television, you're taking on this information. Now, go to the classroom, you're sitting in a nice neat rows in the classroom, uh, and the teacher's sitting standing in front of you and they're talking at you. It worked, right? For the most part. Because as a kid, you were programmed to receive information from a linear fashion from a, from, a, from a single source. But now, from the 80s, video games come around. And now instead of kids sitting there passively watching the, uh, the entertainment, you are actually engaged with these characters. You got Mario. Uh, anyone love Mario here? Got any Mario freaks? All right, go Mario. Luigi? Yoshi? <laughs> Woo! Yeah, I mean, so the thing is, as kids, you know, you become very enamored with these characters. But the difference between uh, this and Mickey Mouse is that you're actually controlling these characters' destinies by making decisions, getting them through a level. You can decide how well you want to go through the level. You go through, you could take Mario and have him uh, you know, go and jump into a pit and then die. Oh, wait, no, that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to jump over the pit, uh, kick the Koopa turtle, uh, run all the way to the end of the level, defeat Bowser and save Princess Peach. Easy enough, right? So, so these kids, like, you know, they're controlling these avatars, they're going through the level, they're, they're making their way through it. They're sometimes once, twice, three times because they want to uh, engage in it, they're perfecting it. So they're, they're controlling these, the stories, controlling these characters as they're being entertained. So they come to class, let's say your classroom is still set up in nice neat rows, and the teacher's lecturing at them. So what happens? Well, the kids are saying, wow, you know, back, back at home, I could control my, uh, my avatar. I could control my entertainment, but now I'm trying to learn, but it's being passively given to me, and I have no control. So what do I do? They disconnect and they go to sleep. <laughs> so, so you kind of see here that the, uh, the entertainment world, that uh, industry of, of how we 
grown up is very strongly affecting how these kids are expecting their education environment. They want the control. They need the control. They need to be able to make decisions. They need to be able to make it through a level and fail so that they can figure out how to succeed. They want this kind of uh, interaction. And, and in education, you know, it's, it's very difficult for us to create that because obviously you can't create a game. But the thing is you can harness that power. So I want to show you this quick little video clip uh, from Vsauce, uh, who's a YouTuber, who explains uh, in a different way this dynamic. In the 1990s, Douglas Rushkoff coined the term screen images to describe a generation that for the first time ever was growing up to think that images on screens weren't just something to passively stare at, but instead were something to be manipulated. Well, today, it's even more extreme. The tools and connectivity provided by the web allow us to think of images on screens not just as things to manipulate, but as things to project our own identities onto. Not everyone who does this is a professional storyteller or acclaimed poet or coherent. But content aside, hyperlinked webs of human expression are incredibly rich environments and they exercise the brain. More so than books? Well, for the sake of argument, let's read From Everything Bad is Good for You, a book by Stephen Johnson. Now, in this passage, he imagines a world in which books were invented after video games and the World Wide Web. Kids everywhere are starting to read these newfangled books, and teachers and parents are concerned. He imagines they might say something like this. <clears throat> Perhaps the most dangerous property of these books is the fact that they follow a fixed linear path. You can't control their narratives in any fashion. You simply sit back and have the story dictated to you. For those of us raised on interactive narratives, this property may seem astonishing. Why would anyone want to embark on an adventure utterly choreographed by another person? But today's generation embarks on such adventures millions of times a day. Reading is not an active participatory process. It's a submissive one. The book readers of the younger generation are learning to follow the plot instead of learning to lead. <clears throat> so, wasn't that an interesting uh, perspective? Mm -hmm. Think about like you know, how you know, if you were to flip things around, how shackling that that model is. And you know, we're trying to break away from that. We're trying to do you know self-paced learning, uh, learn mastery-based learning, where you can go at, at any pace. Uh, in any direction and still end up at the same goal. Uh, that's a lot. So, about what we're trying to do. So let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, video game addiction. As you know, um, it, for, for a lot of people, they, they don't think video game is a, is a real addiction. In fact, uh, there's like a stigma, like people will say, you know, I'm really addicted to video games. Like, yeah, no, 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 you, know, you can put it down. Stop playing. But actually, it, it is a uh, very major problem. In fact, you know, studies uh, recently show that like you know, 97 percent of youth, ages two through seven, have played video games. So it's everywhere. Yeah, that accounts for 64 million kids in the United States alone. Years two, the ages of uh, two to five, are the fastest growing segment of, of kids playing, getting into video games. Because Can I tell you just a funny story related to that age, really quick, like yes. 30 seconds. So about five years ago, my two-year-old granddaughter was at my house, and she asked me, for, and she's like, I'm like, what do you want to do? She's like, cut fruit. And she's two, you know. So I go and I cut up some peaches, <laughs> and, I up some, and I bring her a plate of cut fruit. And she's crying, and she's like, I'm going to my tablet. And she's like, no, cut the fruit, Grandma. And she wanted to play Fruit Ninja. So I'm just going to tell you that, yeah. <laughs>
Now, can you imagine a two-year-old playing a, uh, like an Atari or a joystick or using a mouse and keyboard? It ain't gonna happen. But now we have touch, the touch technology where natural gestures can be translated into a digital form. We're, the, 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 line, the, the line between like computers and, and interaction and everything that we do in life is, is becoming blurred because you know, next thing we know, we'll have gesture-based, uh, which we have with, with Connect. Or if you remember the movie Minority Report, you know, doing all this you know, whiz bang stuff to interface with the computer. The natural, bring, bring the humanity into electronics makes it so that even two-year-olds can interact with these devices now. And I can also say even 80-year-olds can interact with these devices. You know, people who have never grown up with uh, digital mediums can actually interact with these devices. So it's just crazy. So I wanted to, uh, there's this like, uh, really interesting like, news art, uh, uh, piece that I have here. Internet addiction affects millions of people in China, and to fight the problem, rehabilitation camps have opened up around the country. BON was granted rare access to an internet addiction camp in Beijing. BON reporter Jessica Pan has more. 17-year-old Yan Shidong has spent the past two months at a boot camp housed inside a Beijing military compound. He and 20 other peers have been sent here without access to the outside world. Cell phones and computers are strictly forbidden. They rise at 6.30 a.m. every morning to begin military drills. And why? They're being treated for internet addiction. The Chinese Internet Network Information Center reports that there are over 300 million people in China who play online games. And 14% of China's youth, or 24 million people, are addicted to the internet. Researchers use questionnaires to determine if someone has an unhealthy obsession with the internet. Subjects who fit the bill typically spend 10 hours per day, six days per week, playing online games. Addiction researchers from Shijian University have studied the negative effects of internet addiction disorder, also known as IAD. They spoke to be a in via Skype from Xi'an. So, as a term, IAD. <laughs> yeah, it, it, this is real in, in China. China's got it. Huh? No, it is. It's completely real in China. They actually have boot camps and, and today where like, you know, they have interventions and they, they grab these kids and send them off all of a sudden, you know, because they're so addicted to these uh, video games. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's shocking, but you know, it's a problem in China, and it will become a problem here in the United States. Oh, it is. Huh? It is. Oh, it is, yeah. It already is. Not already is. But we don't have any boot camps yet, do we? My boot camp, I made my son play football. I think he played football just so he can play a video game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that's what my parents do. Yeah. You know, you can play, you can do, if you have to do your homework, you can play uh, Tetris. <laughs> Tetris is fun. So, you know, so, you know, so we know it's addiction, so why is it so addictive? Let's, let's talk about the, the, the principles of, of why it's so addictive. Okay, here, so we have, um, you know, first off, it's a temporary escape. So, we play these games because we want to escape from our everyday lives. We want to, you know, kind of like, you know, remove ourselves from the real world and go into a fantasy world or some other world or, or universe that's, that's created by the game. Uh, also, on top of that, it creates a, both a social and anonymity or anonymous aspect of um, social interaction. So you're anonymous, so that means you could be anybody, anything, any, any, you, no matter uh, physical traits, characteristics, you could be anybody you want in these worlds. Uh, social because you're actually also interacting with other people who are like-minded as well. So the social aspect makes it really addicting because you form groups with these people who, who like the same games as you, and then, and, you, and then that actually builds on itself. So that social aspect is, is a, a strong contributor of uh, addiction. So you know, if you're a part of a clan, you know, like you know, clans are, um, are very hot to common in uh, video games, you keep wanting to play because your clan members or your friends on life are playing as well. So, so there's that. Uh, games are also different because there's a, a challenge and a goal. So you present a challenge and you present a goal, and they're driven and motivated to that goal. And the last one here, 
which is actually the one that we're going to key in on in, in uh, education is something that we can fairly easily create. Eight is constant, measurable growth. That is a key factor in video gaming. You start, uh, you, you play a game, you start out as level one, and you make it to level two, you make it to level three, and you're constantly seeing things happen. You're seeing yourself grow, you're getting stronger, you're getting more equipment. And that is a huge factor that makes video games so addicting because you just want to see what's over the next hill, what's uh, what the next thing is, is is open to you. Okay, so I did pass this Nintendo sheet around. I put that up there because I forget uh, a lot. Um, so where is it at? Yeah. Anybody not uh, sign up, sign up on the sheet? All right. Um, pass it somewhere. Whoever needs it, it's right back there. Uh, basically, uh, I'm going to be, uh, be emailing this uh, video and also additional resources uh, and whatnot. So, okay, so for, so video games will never go away, just like. Uh, movies and sports and everything like that because it's a multi-billion dollar industry. In fact, to illustrate that, um, yeah, I watched the Super Bowl this past year and noticed this commercial. So during the Super Bowl, you usually see car ads, movie ads, um, ads for like you know various ads. But this is a, a an ad for a mobile game called Clash of Clans, and we have Liam Neeson actually. Uh, starring in this commercial. Uh, so you think a, a little video game, how, why would that appeal to Super Bowl fans? It's amazing, like the first time I've ever seen a video game ad on, on a Super Bowl. And it's a funny ad. Well, that's because uh, this, clash of, this little game that's uh, actually free to download, so you can download it, you don't have to pay any money at all, makes 1 million, 170, Oh wait, I put an extra one there. <laughs> yeah, that's a very odd number. Got a little enthusiastic there. Um, and you saw that earns that much money a day, a day, a day, a, a day for a free game. So yeah, they can afford a one minute Super Bowl ad because so is it in-app purchases or in-app purchases because. People are addicted to it. They don't have the patience to wait for the upgrade to happen. So they go, oh yeah, this upgrade, it, it only takes like 500 gems. How much is 500 gems? $5? Oh, maybe $5 isn't the much, I'll do that. Next week, oh, I need to do this upgrade. It takes 7,000 gems. Oh, that's only $15, no problem. And then, you know, the, the, this times, the, multiply that times millions of users. They are one of the highest grossing mobile gaming companies in the world. In fact, uh, their, their, their net value is so high that they uh, are the, they rival tech companies who actually provide platform, which are also profiting. So, yeah. so, so what is a gem, like fake money? Yeah, fake money. So a gem is something you collect and you can, you can buy gems with real money to get this fake money so that you can apply <laughs> for fake stuff. Yes, chuckle on that, but people do that. No, I believe I'm not, I'm just saying. And, and I'd say, you know, I play this game, and I've spent five dollars so far, and that's it. <laughs> Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. So you know, so video game is an addiction, and as we can see, it's ubiquitous everywhere. So let's see, you know, you're a teacher. What can you do about it? Well, of course, we want to harness the power of game education. So, but the thing is, like, you know, in order to harness that power, what I want to instill in you is empathy. You know, empathy is key. Because if you don't understand these gamers, how are you going to reach them? So, so the majority of, of this session is, is all about getting you to understand that, so that you could you could apply uh, your current uh, uh, technique, classroom techniques, um, with this type of it, you know, with this empathy. Because the more you know about these kids growing up, you know, from grade school to high school and on to eventually out of college, uh, the better off you will be to reach these kids. Yeah, anyone remember this? <laughs> um, um, in fact, like if you want to like kind of get a really good um, in, uh, ingraining some empathy, like this is actually a uh, best-selling novel called Red, Ready Player One. Um, it's actually being made into a movie. Uh, in 20, no, it was in 2012. Um, but basically, this book was about um, a, a guy who lives in this virtual world uh, because the real world really sucks. I mean, it's just awful. You know? It's a dystopian society. And he goes on this adventure and it has nothing but like video game 80s references. Like it's, if you grew up in the 80s, you'll love this book actually. 
Uh, but the but thing is, like, this entire book is written to the gamer, about the gamer, but from somebody who isn't gaming will still enjoy it because it just talks about that whole entire gaming culture. And, and the subtle nuances about this book is like, you know, what is reality, what is real life, you know, who I am, who, am, who am, I? Am, I, am I? Am I the avatar or am I me in real life and then where's the balance between the two, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a really good thing. So, so, you know, so the more you know, the better off you'll be. And no, I guess after that one. Yeah, I don't. You don't do any G.I. Joe before me? <laughs> yeah! All right, good job. Now, so, um, so knowing this half now, so I want to get you to understand a little bit about games. So first off, I want to start with understanding their language. Uh, you know, they have their own like subculture language, so I'm just going to go over a few um, things called, uh, it's called Leap Speak. Now, Leap Speak was uh, basically originated in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, in their uh, early like kind of modem gaming days, but basically, you know, Leap Speak is just taking like numbers and turning into characters, and uh, but there's used to, to as shorthand. But now we know it as like you know, the shorthand text messages, so it's kind of evolved to that. So some of it actually has filtered into our real life LOL, right? Um, so so like the title said, like you know, um, I put this in there. So um, anybody well, actually, I know a few of you know what what this is, but like you know. When you look at the title in the uh, in the uh, program guide, what, what what did you think about it when you first saw it? Anybody? What did you think about the title when you looked at the story? I misspelled a bunch of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I'm only going to go so I can find out what this is. <laughs> very cool, very cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it might count your attention, right? Yes. Because, of, yeah, because, so this is Leaky C. So basically, it's a translator. It's like, you know, so this is basically somebody sending a message to someone else saying, Hey, new. So new is actually uh, referring to newbies or somebody who's new to the game. You know, they're not really in a day in the culture, so they're, they're kind of like hazing them. Like, you know, so we call, we call them noobs. It could be spelled N E W B, it could be N O O B or N 0 0 B. So they're new, they're new to the game, they're making stupid mistakes. Uh, so we call them noobs. Um, and then it says, I'm elite, L3 uh, so, so I'm, I'm like an elite person, you know, I'm better than you. Uh, and I'm gonna, so PWN is, uh, is basically said, it's, it's like saying, I'm gonna own you or pwn you. So it's just like saying, like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna crush you or defeat you or, or, or something like that. Uh, uh, a camper is basically somebody who, like, you know, if you're playing a game and you sit there and do nothing but wait for somebody to come upon you, it's usually frowned upon because you're not actively engaged in the game, so they hate campers. You know, campers, you know, everyone wants to kill campers because you're just like, you know, going off for the, for the uh, easy kill. So a lot of people hate campers, so if you're sitting there, if you're waiting for something to show up and you shoot, so very important for people, so we, we take them out. Uh, we already know SMH, right? A lot of people know this as shakes my head because we're like, you know, it's, it's just an acronym. And then we got a little squiggly face, like, you know, <laughs> like. Oh, that's a face? Yeah, it's a face. So we got a little eye, kind of going, uh, a little eye, big eye, kind of going, uh, you know, uh, kind of thing, you know. So that's, a, that's like, you know. So wait, wait, so SMH is Shakes my head. Yeah, it's like, like so uh, say it all in say it all in this language and then say it all in English. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude, I'm and I'll pwn you. You camper, shake my head. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So you got that? <laughs> yeah. So you know, so that's just like part of the lead scheme. You know, there's there's a lot of like, little things here and there, but yeah. But you don't really need to fully understand the lead speak. Like, you know, if you if you hear these terms, just ask them what it means, you know, they'll be happy to tell you because they'll love to share. Yeah. And they always like the, you know, the, um, putting like other characters like school, like you know. So in this case, like you know, school isn't schooling. Is. School means like you know, I'm gonna like you know, teach you some new things because you're so new that like you know, I'm gonna school you. But, so I, I don't know how better to explain that. So how would you say that say it? Just say it out. Oh, it would be like a new person or a new. Yeah, a new person. I, I'm an elite and uh, I'm gonna kill you or. or <laughs> defeat you in the game okay. uh, because you're a camper. So. Because <laughs> you're boring. So I would, I, would, I, would, I would say like, hey, hey, person who knows nothing about what I know. Yeah. I'm much better than you. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, be more powerful than you because you're really boring. And you make me, I don't even understand why you're so boring. <laughs> right? I mean, that's how I translate that. I, I love that. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, yeah. that's, that's a much better. Uh, <laughs> Layman's uh, definition than what I could come up with. He's like, you know, I, I can read that, I know what it means, so it's hard to translate that to Right. Me. I can do that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I can be a translator. There you go. <laughs> the new emerging yeah. career. Yeah. <laughs> like, we, we can pair up. We gotta yeah. give ourselves value. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Don't bring your scoop bananas and teach it. Yeah, we got, you want to cut fruit? What's 
similar to that, farming. So farming is kind of similar to grinding, but farming is basically repeating an action over and over again just to gain uh, golden and, uh, and experience points, but you're actually going through a level, but then you're going through that level again, and you're going through that level again. You know, it's the same level you're going through. So basically, you, know, you may have gone through it 100 times. It's the same exact monsters, it's the same exact uh, things that are happening, but you're repeating that action over again because you want to get, get more gold so that you can buy that, uh, that, uh, that sword of plus two with, uh, with uh, lightning power. So what I'm illustrating is like, these kids, you know, you think that they get bored easily. They're doing boring stuff over and over again. How these video game companies make it so that they are addicted to doing boring, repetitive actions over and over again. All right, speed run is a term that basically is, is a challenge term. So when somebody does a speed run, let's say like I'm playing uh, uh, a, a game, Grand Theft Auto Five, and there's this mission that normally takes me five hours to complete. So I start with the beginning of the mission and I make it to the end. Uh, so speed run is a challenge where we're saying, okay, I can make it through this level in 30 minutes because now I know all the subtle nuances of this mission. So I, I can actually get through it so much faster than when I did it for, for the first time. So it's a, a lot of it's a personal challenge. Actually, speed runs are, like, there's actually leaderboards online where, where people are saying, like, you know, I can do it in uh, 29 minutes and eight seconds, 27 minutes and six seconds. And it's, it's just incredible how, how much they time they devote themselves just to do that one action to practice over and over and over again. Yes? Do, do you do all the same steps or you cut out some steps? You, sometimes you cut out steps because you know what's coming up next. Okay. Yeah, so, so there's, there's because you, you've played through that mission, you've played through that level before. So you said, I don't really mean this isn't that valuable. So yeah, so you, you've actually determined, you know, you know how to, from point A to point B, I can cut out uh, point D because uh, I could get that from somewhere else and then there, there might be random variables. So you figure that out. These kids figure these things out because they're, they're, they're going through it so many times that they go, oh, there's a person standing over there. I could probably get the gun from him instead of going you know, across town or something like that. Uh, so raids. Raids are very popular with online games because basically the, what, what it is is just a, it's a group of people getting together and then going to kill a dragon. Very popular with online games. Uh, so whenever, when you hear students say, "I'm going on a raid," or uh, my, my my client has a raid at 10 o'clock, you know, I need 10 p.m. You know, I need to be uh, up for that. Um, that's because that's what they're doing. So they're getting together, coordinating an attack. It's it's a perfect time for the attack because something's going on in the game server that's opening up, like the moons are aligning or something like that, and they're going on a raid. And uh, it's a very very common term. So. In fact, I have a raid coming up right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> in a week, I will be. <laughs> um, and then 100 percenter. Uh, so these are really, uh, some people, I mean, I, I'm not 100 percent. I'm more like an 80 percenter. But, um, but there's, there's like games, in the games, like there's like all these little mini side quests and objectives. So if you, were, if you want to complete a game, like the, let's say the game is normally designed for a 40 hour game. But to have, if you invest 200 hours in it, you can actually get every single collectible item, every single trophy, every single card, every single um, stat, everything, like you know, all the trick jumps or whatever. So there's kids who, are, who, who play endless hours just so they can get that 100% stat and that 100% medal for their, uh, for their Xbox Live or PlayStation. Uh, and they're motivated to do that. <laughs> so, so these are some really crazy Things that I hope that is revealing to you uh, about the gaming culture. Because like, well, what this is telling me is these kids who are very, uh, uh, have this like, attention problem can do all these like repetitive, boring, me seemingly menial tasks and actually have fun doing it. Isn't that crazy? Anyone? You think, I, you think that's crazy? No. Yeah. I, I, it is. So. No? Not crazy. Not crazy. <laughs> they spend a lot of money to study people. Exactly. The they spend a lot of money to study this, and it's a science now. So, um, I want you to kind of understand gaming preferences and, and how that relates to uh, the students. Um, so, basically, we have, um, they're all tailored to each personality type. So, first off, we have FPS. So, FPS stands for first person shooter. So, basically, that's a game like such as uh, Halo, Metal of Honor, Call of Duty, Far Cry. Crack that bottle um, down. 
basically where you're a person and you like have a gun or something like that, a sword or something, and you're in the first person view and you're running through a, um, a maze or a map or something like that. Very, the most popular gaming uh, type out there. Um, so I like to say that like, you know, the kids who play gravity for this, these games, you know, and I'm not saying all of them are. You know, they tend to be more aggressive, they can be violent because like, they're expressing themselves through like destruction. Uh, you know, we've seen that, you know, some people say that they could be bullies as well in real life because they, they're, they're expressing themselves, themselves that way. Like, they can also be big victim because like, you know, when you're playing like in, in an online environment where you compete or where you're fighting against other clans, you know, if they, if they beat you, then you want to get them back because they, they, want, to, they want to like, you know, own you. <laughs> yeah. So here we have, um, you know, but the thing is I like to think that, okay, we have these negative traits, but you know, what about, you know, what, what positive things can we think about people who play first-person shooters? Well, they all, they're very perceptive. You know, they have a very keen eye. You know, they're looking at these maps, or they're, they're engaging, they're looking for cues. They actually know, like, you know, patterns of how people move through a certain map. Like, they're, after they've played it many times, they know that somebody's going to run here and turn left, so they know how to position themselves to, to take advantage of that. So they're very perceptive. They also have to be team players, because a lot of these games you can play solo, but you don't last very long. So you're usually playing with a group of people, you're coordinating, you might have a team where you have people have specializations, like one's a medic, one's a, one's a rifleman, a sniper, and another one's like a heavy grunt. Uh, so, so you have to like coordinate like how, how you want to make it through and win. Uh, Unless they're a camper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they could be a camper. Well, like, get rid of them. So uh, you know, they're very, uh, they have very fast reactions. So they have to be quick, they have to move, they have to like, you know, they hear sounds, they have to like, you know, no, no direction to look. So, so they, they have to be very adaptive. And the best part is they have to be very adaptive. You know, they, they have to adapt to the situation as, as the map changes. You know, there's games that like, you know, the dy dynamics of the map changes based on what's going on. Let's say they do a bombing raid and all the buildings get, get blown up. So now you went from an urban environment to a, to a wild, feet, wide field environment. So, so there's a lot of these aspects. And you've seen a video of like, you know, like one of the, uh, somebody who made a, uh, a video of one of these like first person shooters that they did in real life just to mimic it, so just for fun. So, so, so that, that person was just killing a camp, I just to change that. <laughs> because that person was just kind of sitting there um, waiting for somebody, like, okay, you know, so there's like, okay, I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna knife you. <laughs> Being nice is the lowest way of getting uh, okay, you. Know, what what is out. Full Metal 5? Huh? What, what is Full Metal 5? Oh you, mean, oh, you mean uh, uh, Fallout 4? Or I mean, Metal Gear Solid 4? The very first one you should have waited for. Huh? What are you waiting for? Oh, I mean uh, Metal, Gear, Metal Gear 5. Oh, Metal Gear 5. Which I played already. Is that a first person shooter? Um, no, actually, it's a third person first person shooter. So it kind of is, it kind of isn't. So it has both components, actually. It's, it's one of those mixed genres. Uh, but yeah, it, it could be considered that in some cases. So the next most popular, which is like the one that, like, um, actually I might even say more popular, but first person shooters are very popular, is MMORPG. Um, the reason why it's not as popular is because you know, it's always online, you, um, and uh, sometimes you have to pay a subscription to play these games. So, so you know, games like this are Diablo, World of Warcraft, <coughs> Dota 2, Star Wars, The Old Republic, um, and EVE is actually an online game, but basically you're, you're spaceships, and it's actually, it's an economic game. So I know a lot of business executives business people addicted to E because it's all about economics, about, uh, about exploration and growth. You go and buy cargo from various places and you try to make money and go to a corporation. Whoa, you know, spend your, 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 fun, your free time to go to a corporation instead of your real life. So people are like that, they're probably more reclusive, they're passive, they can be antisocial. <laughs> you know, but let's look at the uh, you know, they're great team players. You know, they understand the economics. They know like you know, the value of the things that that they really have because like every single item has a value. They have to figure out like, you know, is this sword worth like 100 gold or we have to get 200 gold for it? You know, maybe I can modify it to give it more traits so I can get more value out of it. Uh, they also very goal oriented because like they have to figure out uh, where they want to be in the game to to make it through. So they like you know, there's different uh, different classifications. So you have to you have to specialize. So you can't just do and become everybody. But you know, but a, spec a specification would be like you know, I want to be uh, uh, a, uh, a <coughs> war mage. So basically, you're a mage. You have magical abilities, but you can also wield a sword. So, but you can't do like uh, an archer war mage or something like that. Um, they're uh, they're they're very social. They, you know, these games are 
highly social uh, because you're working with people, you're working against people. Uh, oops, you're digitally social. Um, you're good at decision making and, and they have to plan. So the planning part is the best because when you do these online games, you have to, you're, you're something to go on a race, so you have to make, make these plans, coordinate people, and then you're going to kill a dragon. But to kill a dragon, you can't just go kill a dragon. You have to actually you know, do a lot of pre planning, probably pick up like, these like, scrolls and keys and things like that, and even to eventually get there. So, uh, so just kind of like, yeah, it's kind of hard to see this picture. But when you look at this, this is actually the, uh, the kind of the skill tree for Dota 2, which is one of those games. So every single one of these stuff is a skill. So you start off in the middle and you go in any direction. So you know, let's say this is like a, a you could use a sword, you could use a bigger sword, you could use a shield. So eventually they make it to like one end. So they could become like a super shield wielding uh, power badass. Uh, or they could go, okay, I want to instead of going here, I want to go up here and become an archer, but down here we have uh, magic skills. So they're like, okay, I want to do a class, I'm going to go here and here instead of just specializing in one direction. So they're looking at this skill, like, they go, what do I want to be? You know, I want to be this, I want to be that. You know, I, I gravitate toward, toward magic uh, power, so I like to go here, but I don't want to be relying on magic, so I want maybe a little bit of like, uh, ranged weaponry, so I go over here. So they go here and here and here and here and here. There we go. So, <laughs> So there's a, a lot of different choices, but you look at look how complicated that is, and they can digest this information, which is crazy. All right, so the next one we have is fighting uh, games. Yeah, Mortal Kombat is the most popular one in Street Fighter. Everyone's heard of Mortal Kombat. You know, the graphic, the gory game, the game that <coughs> you're ripping people's heads off. This is actually an older version before it got super gory. You know, it was gory back then. Uh, Mortal Kombat uh, 2, I believe, is that one. <coughs> You know, so these kids are more aggressive, they can be violent, they're very competitive, so you're going head-to-head -head with another person, but they, they're highly perceptive, they have to be able to see and react to the other person, the fast reaction, they're adaptive, because every single player has a different play style, so when you're playing back in the arcade game, you, you may be playing one player, and then you play against someone else, so you have to, and it's a different character, so, and they have really good memories, like, you know, these, like, these, these characters, they have like, these crazy combo moves, you have to like, you know, hit A, B, C, uh, left, right, to, uh, do all these different combinations to pull out these moves. And if you do it right, you can actually you know, own the other player and, uh, and knock them out in, like, uh, in two hits. So, so, that, so, they, so they practice, they practice, they practice to do that. And they're very determined. Okay, so the next one I'll pull up here is uh, Action Adventure. You know, like the games that are very popular is like Assassin's Creed, which just came out like, a few weeks ago. Uh, the Drake series Tomb Raider, which is coming out, actually, is it out now? I think it's out now, the new Tomb Raider. Yeah, the new Tomb Raider, Batman's got Metal Gear. Metal Gear put into the uh, action adventure realm because it's a mix of a first person shooter and not. But, but basically, you know, these, the, the thing is with these games, uh, for the most part, is that they're very linear. They usually follow up uh, a, uh, like an a, a, a episodic chapter type, type of uh, flow. So, like, you know, so they're really good at, like, you know, these kids, like, they're good following orders because they're like, okay, what's next, what's next, what's next. Um, they can accept competitive actions because a lot of these levels are exactly the same. So if they fail on that level, then they have to play it over again from the beginning, possibly, and then they have to do the whole thing over again, which actually to me is really aggravating. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, so and they can uh, accept linear types of education because they're they're, they're kind of like you know more immersive to the story than anything else. And we have like you know people who are running through the streets in Paris actually. And these are real people. <laughs> Not video game. All right, so this one here is a uh, real-time strategy, and real-time strategy is basically games where like you're, you're commanding a map and troops. And what, what I like, I like this is that these are games that I like because you're like a general and you've got troops moving around your field bases. So you know, they can be reclusive, but now we're looking at like you know, they're very good planners. They're uh, very resourceful because they have to manage resources and money to be able to beat the other player. So because everyone's typically on, on an ego, even playing around. They're good multitaskers and they're very analytic. So, uh, so, the, the, so these next few actually uh, really don't have very many negatives because they're more of the analytic uh, type of players. Like an RPG, you know, the only thing I can say about that is they're very reclusive. So games like Fallout, the Boulder Gate, Zelda. So RPG stands for real role-playing game. So it's kind of like you know you think of like the good old-fashioned Dungeons and Dragons where where you're rolling dice, but now translated to a digital realm. You're like leveling up your character, you're getting better skills, you're getting better armor. You start out level one, then you make your way to level 100. 
So they're good planners, they're determined. So they're very similar to MMORPG, but without the social component, because they're playing by themselves. And uh, simulation strategy, which is my very favorite category of what I spent the majority of my life in, uh, with like SimCity, Sims, uh, Capitalism, which is, which is actually where I learned a lot about business because I had this business simulator where you had to build manufacturing plants and do research and development, you know, um, actually um, you know, put money into training and, and, st and staff development and all that kind of stuff. But these are, are, um, are, these games are super addictive because this is a very common term in video game. If you ever play Civilization, just one more turn. Because when you're playing these games, you're making these moves, you're like, okay, I need to stop, but I just want to do one more and see what happens. And you're like, oh gosh, something happened after you make these decisions. All right, just one more. Okay, six hours later, oh, I just need to do eight hours later. <laughs> so so you, can, you can easily lose yourself in these games because it's this constant like thought process of like what's going to happen next and what, what I have to do to react to it. But they are great players, they are mechanics and they're very analytical. And look at me, I survived. <laughs> right? So, uh, and the last thing is like time wasters. You know, uh, this one I want. Candy Crush, Day Day, Solitaire, Candy Crush. Yeah. You know, so the negative aspect is that they're bored easily. <laughs> I say this jokingly. You know, and they have addictive personalities. So so the you know Candy Crush. Oh my gosh, you know, how crazy addictive is that game? Uh, and any good traits about it? None. Nothing. There's nothing good about time wasters. They're just there to, to waste brain power. There's really no no uh, no uh, inherent value or positive trait about people who do. Maybe time it's relaxing for time wasters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So oh, it's, 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 it's people who want to relax about it. <laughs> but we're trying to find like you know how do we take these time wasters? We we know that they want to relax a lot. Okay. <laughs> I know, I know, I do that. I play these games too. I, I play Heyday, you know, <laughs> and, and it relaxes me actually. So, and the last category, Minecraft. Minecraft? Itself? Minecraft, Minecraft. Okay, so, negative traits? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's so new that, you know, I'm still trying to figure out this new phenomenon. Three year olds are playing Minecraft. But one thing I do have to say is, like, it's really fascinating because. These kids, you know, who are actually you know engaging on a PC landscape, we can start on a PC. You know, it's, I think of it as like you know Legos. You know, they're building stuff. They're expressing their creativity. You know, they're curious about like you know these like these blocky characters and how to like change this world and, and, and move these blocks around and, and build castles. So it's it's, it's very Lego esque mentality. Um, so they, so they're very imaginative and and you know, crafting is very key because you have these components that you collect. You can create like a better axe, or you can create a fire, or you can create these like different things. So, so there's a lot of really cool aspects about these uh, Minecraft apps, like that's really crossing a lot of boundaries. So uh, it remains to be seen, like you know, what's going to happen because these Minecraft characters, players, are like you know, five year olds, six year olds, seven year olds, and as they grow up and, and get in, into the, our education system, you know, how are we going to adapt to their gaming needs? In the classroom. So, any, anybody who has uh, uh, family members who play Minecraft? And how old are they? 14. 14? I tried, 14? I tried to explain it to me the other day. Is it hard? And he did well, he doesn't talk much. But yeah. Yeah, he, I said, okay, so what's. And I tried to, because I haven't played it, and mm -hmm. I was curious about the environment. Yeah. What? There are several different ways you can play. Mm-hmm. Sports games? Sports games? I didn't even include that category. It's just sports. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I thought about including that, but they're, they're, sports games are popular, but they're not as popular as the other genres. They're more, they're very niche to people who love sports. So. Do they actually want to play? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You like Madden, you like football, you know. Like in, in a jam, you like uh, basketball. Uh, so, so and then you know they can be fans or they can be uh, of that genre already. So, you know, so you know, uh, I was want to say that you know we've already been doing gamification, uh, but we've been doing it manually for decades. You know, uh, having to craft these like you know reward systems, like you know you get this gold star, you get this like little trophy. Here you got chocolate candy. I don't know if you know how to do that, but <laughs> you know, things like that. So, so we've been doing it manually, but digitally. You know, all these things can be automated, so we do it with technology. Um, 
Um, we're out of time with, uh, with this video, so I'm going to skip that one. But, but technology can be used in very many ways. And, and what I want to show you here really briefly is, is how, um, how we could like, you know, use our wisdom to guide the students through the information highway and utilize the technology as a tool to, to, to bring this all together. Um, so first off, I want to say, like, you know, do, we make the, uh, do we make education into a game? That's the first question I ask. A lot of people think, yeah, right? Um, I say, oh, no, 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 no. Don't make the education into a game. Once you do that, you got the cheese factor involved, and they're going to judge you versus the game. You, you don't want to make, make kids think that like, you know, education is a game, because you're going to be compared on that level. We don't want you to be compared to Warcraft, to uh, Diablo, to Fallout. We don't, we don't even want to have that association. We have to separate ourselves from video games, and entertainment, and, and, and education. <coughs> so, go ahead and dispel the myth of gamification. Gamification is not creating a game. It is not creating a simulation. It is not making fun activities all the time. Now, you can't have fun activities, but you can't make constantly make fun activities. That takes a lot of effort. <coughs> it's not entertainment. It's not entertainment. Okay, don't make a video game. So, but gamification is using the subtle psychological cues of reward, uh, intrinsic and extr ex extrinsic rewards to get people students to be motivated to get to the next prize. So, because we want them to think of it as a personal accomplishment. So, the other key is we want to personalize it and make it unique for everybody. That's one of the beauties of video games. It's like my experience for one of these games can be completely different than his experience because I made different decisions and chose different paths. I, I reacted differently. And it's all about personalization. Um, but the key is like, you know, we take what we do right now, but we just apply it to a new model. So, so we want to gamify the education experience. So the core motivators, like we just to recap is, we want them to have this feedback. We want them to see steady, beautiful progress. We want them to see achievements, <coughs> awards, and badges. I know we had a big discussion about badges and micro credentialing for this. Yes, it's a feel-good thing, but eventually it'll turn into something that can be brought into the industry. All right, so I'm not going to have sort of this because we're getting email about that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two tools. One of them is, is one that, uh, that is near and to my heart. There's another one I also want to point out that's actually pretty cool. It's called 3D Game Lab. So here's the contrast between two. So 3D Game Lab is an open platform. allows you to customize it. They have their reward center. So everything they do is about getting rewards. So, so like if you do this, you get this. If you do this, you get that. So it's a very, very direct um, um, black and white type of approach. Um, they actually have virtual currency, so you can earn enough experience points you could buy yourself, I don't know, some, something rewarding, which is pretty cool. Uh, they have branches, so basically you start off with one point, and kind of like what you saw with the leveling system you saw earlier, so you can start branching uh, your education path uh, as well. Uh, and you can see like, you know, good progression through that path. So, so this is a, a company that does it, uh, and they actually have a really great platform that allows you to do it, to do it for free, and they have a lot of good, and then a lot of good, um, um, Examples online as well, and then there's uh, this other one that's called Cape Compass. Uh, so I'm the founder of that uh, company, and, and the key with that is like you know, uh, currently it's it's a, in a, a closed beta uh, because we're not opening it up to just about anyone to jump in and, and, and run with it. We're looking for like individual pioneers that we meet uh, at conferences or little people who, who refer themselves to us. But I've had teachers like one like one who's developed this amazing music education module. And, and she's sharing it with other teachers. And it's just like, wow, you know, how did you craft that? And she just used all your content online and, and built these modules out of it and gamified it at the same time. So it's like, it's really cool. So it's, it comes with an offering suite. It's very content-centered. So the entire drive isn't just about the words achievement, but also getting the students to learn and master content. Uh, there's artificial intelligence built in, which is like, which is one of the key factors I feel. Like I said, <coughs> you have all this power. You could build the artificial intelligence to give individualized uh, instructions to the students, and, and it uses like uh, abundant assessments. So these students who go through our learning system go through hundreds of assessments, and uh, and, they, and and they actually enjoy doing it. So uh, so it's called Casey Compass, and currently we're in about a thousand schools across the country who are who are using this computer piece of technology. Uh, and so far, three hundred thousand students have already gone through it and mastered the content. Now they've done this uh, in, in, because in the past like five years, we've done it in certain subject areas uh, that's, that's already been pre-authored. So these, these subject areas are, have been done by Paxton Patterson, 
who, uh, who actually is a vendor who actually uses that technology to deploy their, their content. And, uh, and they do it in like, you know, STEM education, kind of construction, health careers. Uh, Total Seminars does it in ICT certification. Uh, KB Coloring does it in coloring arts education, which is basically how they all got started was uh, teaching these coloring kids. You know, they love to work with knives and, and Thank you. 